Please come into my room. Welcome back to the Mustache Room. I am your host, David Ben, and I'm really excited about this episode. We have a good friend of mine, Dan, from when I lived in Tampa. I met him in Ohio. We kind of migrated down south together, and then I came out here to Denver. Anyway, I love this guy. He's very well-versed in the area of psychedelics and mental spiritual improvement. And so I thought he was a really cool guest to have on, and I think you'll really enjoy the conversation we had. We talk about Lemon Tech, a walk through the process, pros and cons. We familiarize you with the term chitin. Try to spell that. Good luck. <laughs> um, we also talk about the Johns Hopkins psilocybin playlist and why that was developed, what it's comprised of, and what it's designed to do. Also, good friend Sean, who was on the previous episode, hops back on to do his integration, talk about his experience. He took a heroic dose and really has some positive reflections. So I think you guys are going to enjoy this. No segment from Wifey Jill. Check us out, mustacheroom.com. Uh, our sponsor is Mustache Brands. M-U-S-T-A-S-H is how we spell it. Enjoy. We did a podcast together back in the day in Florida and Tampa. Um, yes. The, uh, the Frightened Ear. You were kind of like, <laughs> you and Tomas were the uh, the original guests. You guys were on all the time. Um, and that was awesome, man. I mean, that was yeah. early mixed martial arts too, and it was still kind of gaining momentum. Yes, it was uh, good times. Good times. <laughs> so. Yeah. Times when we had more hair. <laughs> We've, I don't know about you, but I, th I think mine was pretty much gone by then. It ran away. <laughs> yeah. I mean, both of us, father time, you know, it's, uh, it's done, done a little damage to our, to our heads, but I think we've done the best <laughs> with it. You know, made the most I actually it. prefer it better now because it's so much less maintenance and like less worry about how your hair is going to look in the morning and all that right? other shit. So yeah. <laughs> and when, and when you just being self-conscious about it and everything. So, <laughs> yeah. And I think also, you know, the, uh, the haircuts are easy. Um, just everything's easy. The wind doesn't scare me anymore. <laughs> <laughs> you know, everything's in play. Like you're, you're almost bulletproof. Um, yeah, yeah. Except for the every... sun. I mean, so. <laughs> well, I mean, that's what the bucket hat is for, man. Have you yeah. adopted the bucket hat, the full 360 degree coverage? No, no, I haven't gone that far. <laughs> oh man. The bucket hat is a bald man's best friend. So, uh, <laughs> <bucket hat. laughs> I've seen you, I've seen you sporting that on some of your, uh, hiking photos. So, <laughs> Yeah. I mean, well, I, you know, I've been balder a little bit longer than you have. I mean, uh, yeah. so, you know, I figured it out a little bit earlier on, but yeah, once you <laughs> discover the bucket hat, I mean, there's no turning back. <laughs> <laughs> so the, uh, yeah, the podcast we did for the listeners, mixed martial arts, comedy, just kind of like, you know, just shooting the shit. And I had a hundred episodes before I called it quits before I moved to Denver. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, it was a milestone. <laughs> Let's um, hope that this one goes a lot further. So. Yeah, man. I mean, you know, as long as the interest is there and uh, like I was telling you earlier, you know, the whole central theme of the podcast is um, mushroom cultivation, mushroom consumption, psychedelics, physical, personal, mental wellness. And yeah. so my friend, Sean, who's like a breathing expert, yoga instructor, uh, he okay. was on the previous episode to talk about holotropic breathing, uh, breath mm -hmm. work, uh, your boy, Wim, Wim Hof. Uh, yes. Is that how you pronounce it? Yeah. Wim Hof. Yeah. Yeah. He's talking about him and like some of his uh, accomplishments and breath patterns and that kind of stuff. But that just kind of plays into the overall theme. And I know okay. you, you've been a, a big um, proponent of like, you know, mental wellness, spirituality. Uh, I see, you know, a lot of stuff on Instagram. You seem to have um, done a lot of expir exploration in that space. And so I wanted to bring you on and uh, kind of get your thoughts on yeah, lots of exploring. Um, not so much now. Um, probably since my last mushroom experience has been, I would say, like two years ago. But in my earlier years, um, heavily, I would say I've probably done 200 plus explorations. So, oh, shit. 200 <laughs> plus. With, yeah, with mushrooms and other psychedelics. Yeah. Okay. What would you say is your, your favorite? My favorite was mescaline or mescaline. Peyote. I don't know which, how you pronounce it, so but peyote. Yes. Peyote. Basically. Syn uh, I guess you could say a synthetic form of peyote. So we used to go to this place in Ohio. It's called Nelson's ledges. Hell yeah. And, I've yeah, been there. And, yeah. And that's where I uh, got it from some hippie dudes that were in a trailer <laughs> and they were there like every weekend. So 
I would go there and pick up a few, like give it to my friends and experience it myself. So, yeah. And how long did you, how long did the trips last for you on Mescaline? Um, I would say about eight to 10 hours, depending on the dosage amount. <laughs> yeah. That's what I heard. It lasts a little bit longer. Yeah. The visuals and the, the, the psychological aspect, it, it was like that, that's what I really enjoyed. Not so much like a body stuff, body, I guess a body hire or anything like that, that you get from like LSD or anything. Yeah. So, but yeah, the, the masculine, yeah, very intense visuals. And I guess you could say like just the psychological aspect of it. So, yeah, I, yeah. the thing, the thing about peyote mescaline, and that's not legal here. I think that's legal in Oregon because they just don't give a shit. <laughs> <laughs> they don't give a shit about anything. <laughs> right. But other than Oregon, like the rest of the country, uh, peyote mescaline is still not legal. You can yeah. order from Thailand, other places. You can order seeds and plants if you want. But yeah. you can't buy them locally. Unless I heard Home Depots around the country that are not privy to San Pedro being used ceremonially. <laughs> so they'll sell it. <laughs> they'll sell stocks to San Pedro. So I guess if you run into one of those by chance. Yeah, um, eBay yeah. has them available, but yeah, traditional means you can't really yeah. buy and use. And I don't know how I would feel about like getting it from Home Depot and then experimenting <laughs> from that aspect, you know, because you my, buy it my in a big ass, orange bucket. Yeah, yeah. My ass would just end up like taking the half the damn thing and like <laughs> I'm gone for three days. <laughs> right. Because there's no $500 plants at Home Depot. So you could buy several. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but, I think uh, that's one that's a little bit more mysterious, too. You know, there are a lot of people that have recounts of their psychedelic experiences with psilocybin or LSD, yeah. but the peyote seems to be a little bit more of an outlier. Um, not that it's bad or people have bad trips on it, but it just seems to be a little bit less readily available Yeah, from what I've seen. Yeah, yeah. Especially, I mean, I, mean, I, I guess I was lucky just to come across those people because they traveled... I mean, at least these guys, I remember that they traveled around, but they would, um, during certain parts of, I guess, the summer, they were just happened to camp at Nelson's Ledges for several weeks or a month or whatever it was. So, Fucking hey, man. Well, uh, you struck gold, my friend. <laughs> yeah, two of my favorite pictures. You've probably seen them when you've been over to my place. There are two really abstract pieces of art where yeah. they're just interwoven naked images and crazy yeah. shit. Those I got at Nelson Ledges in 99. Okay. Yeah, I think we've talked about that in the past, yeah. Yeah, I just moved to Warren, Ohio from St. Petersburg, Tampa, Florida. Yeah. And uh, I eventually moved back, but that was one of the first things that I did was went to one of the hippie fests at Nelson Ledges. Yes, good times there, man. <laughs> lots of good, lots of crazy times, lots of good times. So. Absolutely, man. Um, very cool. Blast from the past there, Nelson Ledges. <laughs> I, I, I don't necessarily have like firm agendas for the podcast, but... Um, there are a couple of things that I wanted to, to bring up that are relevant that I want to get your thoughts on. First thing, this is a little off topic. We moved into, and I can't wait for you to see our place in Denver, but we moved to a, a new townhome. It's over in, um, in, the, in the Denver area. Okay. And right behind us, there's kind of like a vacant, a few vacant lots that are adjacent to each other. And then like a street that's just not really used all that much. Yeah. And a, home, a homeless encampment formed on this street. Oh, and, wow. Yeah. Lots of tents. So it became like Skid Row almost. <laughs> Bro, I call it Skid Row Lafayette because that's the name of the name of the street. And so it's bad, man. Somebody shit on the side of my garage and I had to clean it up. There's like urine and fecal matter and people leaving like all their personal belongings in the alley behind my house. At any given time, you can see like somebody getting assaulted inside of one of the tents over there in this oh homeless encampment. There's needles and propane tank it's just a fucking disaster right this is something and, out of a movie <laughs> yeah and i mean you know me i'm not a, a heartless individual i'm not yeah, yeah. you know i don't like to trivialize the human life and yeah i don't want to be apathetic to that but at the same time um, you're like come on <laughs> yeah i'm about to have a baby girl and yeah. safety and health and these factors there's no way to control or know that there's not like a sex offender living in that home yeah family. exactly so we've the neighborhood and i we've tried to take the appropriate means to address this issue. Um, yeah. first and foremost, clean it up. So it's not as disgusting and you can walk down the street. Yeah. Yeah. And, but also make sure that you know, they try to get these people help and ultimately get them away from my neighborhood. 
Uh, (laughs) I know that sounds really cold, but I just, they need to be somewhere else. Yeah. So it's, it's been cool. We got, um, we got a, a walkthrough with the police officer. I showed him the feces. I showed him the urine. I showed him like all the trash. I told him my stories and they said, March 9th, they're going to move the encampment. And so I feel like, so how did they go about moving that? Like that's, well, here's something that I found that one of my neighbors sent. There's some housing being built here uh, that is going to have 98, what does it say? 75 beds, medical services. It's like a $4 million project here in downtown yeah. Denver. I don't know when they're going to break ground on it, yeah. but this is hopefully the long-term solution. You know, if they replicate this model elsewhere, they'll have some permanent fixture where these people can get help. But yeah, yeah the cleaning process is relocating them, relocating their belongings because essentially their yeah, yeah. hoarding is still their belongings. And then trying to get them some sort of rehabilitation if they're on drugs, permanent housing, employment, whatever they can do. Yeah. But a lot of these people are what they call service resistant. So they'll try to get them help and they'd much rather be on the streets and you know, doing what they're drugs. doing. Exactly. Yeah. And hey, when, when I talk about drugs, you know, I'm talking about the meths, you know, the heroines, the, the cracks, the, yeah. that, that category. Not, they're not, not, the, they're not just out there smoking blunts and <laughs> drinking <right>. 40s. <laughs> yeah. Not the uh, quote unquote drugs that somehow got lost and found themselves in the schedule one category. Yeah. Like, just yeah. have no business. Being. <laughs> so yeah. Cannabis and psychedelics and theogens, those don't count. Yeah. Yeah. Especially so, it's kind of scary when you're finding needles on the ground and all that stuff. So dude, I know, man. And so again, I, I want to help them. And if there was a direct path to, Hey, let me walk you over to the clinic over yeah. the yellow big road and here we go but it doesn't exist like that so yeah uh, i'm not spraying a fire hose on their encampment during the winter <laughs> or setting a blaze to their propane tanks or anything like that yeah but yeah hopefully well, you're doing the, you're doing the right thing i mean you're trying to go the right path with it so yeah a lot of tweeting a lot of video documentary uh documentation to show what i'm up against but yeah, yeah still trying to be diplomatic as, as much as possible yeah I don't know how it feel with the, the shitting next to my house. Like, uh, <laughs> and it's not like I can, can just take, you know, a pressure washer. It's out on the backside of my house, backside of my garage, no hose or anything is going to, going to reach out there. So I had to take my dumb ass with some gloves and essentially everything I could find to cover myself up with and scrape the shit off the side of the wall uh, with like a paper plate. Uh, it was the most humiliating and, um, Whew, I, I can't even describe how awful that experience was. For me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so not, not to shit on the homeless people, no pun intended, or actually pun intended, but, <laughs> um, but hopefully they get the treatment they de- they need with this $4 million project yeah. and not in close proximity to my residence. <laughs> in the meantime, something I did when I lived in uh, Palm Harbor, we ha- used to have these crane, what, I don't know, those, you know, those white Florida crane looking birds. I don't know what they're oh, yeah. called. But they used to come and we had a pond in our front yard and eat all the damn fish. So they have a motion sensor like uh, water hose thing that sprays high pressured water. So it was motion censored. And it would spray them <laughs> wow. to get them off your lawn. So maybe that um, would deter homeless people. <laughs> I don't know. Well, you know what? I mean, sometimes you have to resort to extreme measures. And I mean, <laughs> I mean, it's just water. Thing, but <laughs> Right. It depends on the season. But it was Palm Harbor, so it's never too cold. That's not yeah. cool. I'll put that in the semi-cruel okay. <laughs> category. So uh, let's, let's, let's move past the homeless issue. I'll provide the listening audience an update after March 9th. Yeah. Um, I'll have a glass of scotch celebrating um, their move forward to get help and move away from my home. Yeah. Yeah. Not a bad person. I know it sounds bad. That's where I'm at. <laughs> all right. So gonna couple- have to, you're going to have to be dealing with a lot of shit when you have a baby. That's all I got to say. <laughs> Dude, on so many levels. Yes. We are, uh, we're due it in June. So you've got, you've got how many kids now? Two. They're seven and eight. The experience is different for each kid. And I mean, you're doing some similar things, of course, changing diapers, things like that. But yeah, um, behavior wise and I guess the parenting style is a little bit different for just depending on how the kid responds to it. So, yeah, I mean, but no one has a clue like your parents didn't have a clue. raising you. <laughs> Mind, like you realize that as you like as you through the years of doing it, like you're like, 
they didn't have a fucking clue. They were just doing the best they could. <laughs> right. And at first you're probably hyperventilating and freaking out. But oh, yeah. uh, over time you, you relax a little bit and start to get in the swing of things. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good. <laughs> I have like all these books. Everybody's giving me baby books. Little do they know. I don't like to read. Like if you gave, if you gave me an yeah, audible I remember, credit. I remember you don't like to read. Yeah. If you gave you're me like, an audible credit or like yeah. some, maybe some pop-up books or something that's more my level. But I get all these books and I've read one of them. Um, iteratively with my wife like as the weeks progress like here we yeah. are in week 24 or whatever but the other ones i haven't broken a seam so <laughs> i've got some work to do uh no just put them in the bathroom just put them in the bathroom like you get to- <laughs> bro the phone has ruined bathroom reading like the phone <laughs> yes the scrolling is so much easier so much less work than reading yes <laughs> but anyway so i have some good books i will read them but i'm way behind them <laughs> But yeah, I can't wait to uh, to pick your brain about fatherhood and you know paternal stuff because uh, I you're one of you're like one of my friends that I know has like a really good heart. Like I know you're just a good person, and so yeah. those people I always look to you know when I need like any sort of coaching and life experience that they have that I don't. Have. So I yeah. definitely will pick your brain because I think you're a, a good uh, be a good mentor in that space. For me. All right, thanks, man. <laughs> yeah, no problem. don't get a big head. I mean, that's just just one. But, uh, compliment. I don't know how much help I'll be, but I'll try to guide <laughs> you as <best> as possible. <laughs> so I wanted to ask you, man. One of the things that I thought was really cool that I've been learning about with um, psychedelics, consuming mushrooms, is how to prep them and get like the most bang for your buck. Mm-hmm. Do you have like did was there a, a certain process that you followed when you consumed them? to try to maximize the uh, overall experience? Well, I I think I've gone the traditional routes where like you just eat them raw when chug them down with some water. I've done the whole, put them in a peanut butter sandwich, eat them like that. But my last um, experience, what I did, I brewed them like a tea and then I um, pulverized it. And then like I strained it and then I took the soft mushrooms and then like I pureed it almost like in a food processor. And then I uh, seeped it in hot water and then uh, consumed it that way. So I drank also, I drank it and then okay. also uh, consumed the soft, I guess a mush of it. How was that? Um, it was probably the most intense um, mushroom uh, experience that I had. Like me and my friend did it um, here at my place. And uh, of course we went, put on some pink Floyd cause I haven't listened to him forever. <laughs> uh, we but, went to go see the wall uh, light show. Okay. We were, we were on some mushrooms and Oh, that had to be awesome. got pregnant. Yeah. Pink Floyd, the wall. I'm not a big pink Floyd fan, but in that context, Oh in yeah. That headspace. Now yeah. I'm a fan. <laughs> yeah. Th- it th- that's what turns you into a fan. And when you experience them like that, but we were oh, yeah. listening to, um, it, it was just a compilation of the wall and some of their other, mm-hmm. other music, but yeah, me and my friend, um, we did that and we both had similar visuals, even th- like we both had our eyes closed, but we were seeing the same exact thing. So after we like kind of discussed like what we were seeing, like after when we kind of came down from the trip, he saw the same exact thing, exact things that I was seeing, which was kind of kind of weird. So I, I called it like the pulse of life and uh, he referred to it in a similar manner. So, yeah, yeah the but music, it was, it was, man, it's. It's amazing how the sensories, you know, get, they all get engaged and the music kind of acts as a, an impetus for all that stuff to come together. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's, it's so a beautiful cool. thing. And especially it's, what, you know, the, the, the melody of Pink Floyd and, you know, the lyrics and stuff like that, but yeah, it was, yeah. it was, it was pretty cool. So <laughs> yeah. The, uh, the reason that I asked you is because my, my buddy Felix, who he's been on the podcast, um, I, we trained jujitsu together okay. and he said that his wife, gets she gets nausea she she gets nauseous when she takes mushrooms and mm-hmm. so you know she's apprehensive and whatnot and so i've been reading about how like different methods to try to consume mushrooms to alleviate some of the nausea activate more quickly blah 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 and it yeah. seems like the best method and my friend patrick and felix have both alluded to this is what they call the lemon tech and okay. so with lemon tech i'll just bring up this article here and you can let me share this with you Share. Come on, I'm an IT guy. I can't fucking figure out <laughs> Zoom here. Uh, Probably just paste it in the chat there. Yeah, let me do that. I'll let you bring it up separately. That's better. 
and a listening audience, my new podcast studio is going to be fucking awesome. So uh, I apologize for any of the minor uh, inconveniences along the way. So yeah, this is um, Double Blind Mag. I'll put this in the show notes on the Mustache Room website, uh, doubleblindmag.com. They have an article called How to Lemon Tech, A Complete Guide for Mushroom People. And, And essentially what happens with the mushrooms is when you consume the mushroom, it has like this exoskeleton that is actually similar to ants. And um, there's more details in this article, but it's this exoskeleton that's made of chitin. And okay. the chitin takes a while. Chitin is spelled C-H-I-T-I-N. Mm-hmm. It takes a while to break down. So that's why when you consume the mushrooms without doing tea or something like you just talked about, it takes a while for the acid in your stomach to break through this chitin, the outer shell of the mushroom, and actually extract the psilocin, which is the active ingredient in the psilocybin. So what this lemon tech does is you take the acid from either a lemon or a lime. They both have similar pH levels, acidity levels as the the stomach, as the stomach acids. You basically take your, your mushrooms, you grind them up, chop them up. You, after they're completely dry, bone dry, put them in your lemon juice or lime juice and let them sit for like 15 minutes. And it ostensibly, and there's not a lot of science around this. It's a lot of it's rhetoric yeah, and yeah. Things line. <clears throat> it, it ostensibly turns the psilocybin into psilocin, which is the active entheogen ingredient that interacts with the serotonin in your brain and mm-hmm. gets to the point more quickly. So you invoke the experience more quickly. It supposedly hits you like a ton of bricks right off the bat. And okay. all the, the effort that you're body normally has to put forth to break down all the chitin and do all that stuff in your stomach. It doesn't have to do that. So supposedly the come down is a little bit less extreme. Okay. So this lemon tech is a great way to kind of mitigate some of that potential nausea, nausea by trying to break down the chitin. Some people yeah. don't have the enzyme that allows you to even break that down at all. Yeah. So if that's the case, you know, you kind of have to take this route and you don't even have to uh, consume the mushrooms. You could just consume the extract. Okay. You wanted to not have the pulp or whatever the, yeah. you know, the mushroom substances. So this article is pretty it? cool. I've tried it with lemon and honey. Okay. So my friend Felix, we did a very similar process, but instead of just doing lemon juice, we used lemon juice and honey. Okay. And we waited about 30 minutes for it to fully break down. And I do remember it hit me pretty quick. Yeah. Um, I can't say I didn't do like a full integration, like take notes and stuff. So yeah. some of it's kind of fuzzy, but I do remember it being invoked a little bit more quickly than like when I ate it with some peanut butter or something. Yeah. 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 Well, a lot of like, I mean, plants and mushrooms, they all have like a protective coating on it because that's, it's just there to, like for protection. So, cause animals are going to eat it, things like that. But <clears throat> a lot of humans, that's why when they they eat certain amount of like greens or, you know, certain, like say a vegetarian that eats a lot of like greens and mushrooms, things like that. Sometimes they end up with digestive problems over the long period because their, their, their gut isn't able to break down that, the, the, the protective layers. Cause I mean, beans have it, you know, uh, kale has it. I mean, even any type of green has it and especially mushrooms. So. Yeah. So it might not be chitin technically, but it's a similar yeah. like exoskeleton. Yeah. Yeah. It's just okay. a protective layer from bugs, from, you know, animals that are eating it. So very cool. Yeah. So I didn't know, you know, I never got any nausea, but I always do a little bit of fasting before yeah. I take my mushrooms. And yeah, I guess I have a pretty hardened stomach. Like I'll take all my vitamins on an empty stomach. I don't give a shit. <laughs> yeah. You're like, after the stuff I've eaten in my life, this is not. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, short of poo, I've eaten pretty much everything. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, it's cool to know what it is that might cause some discomfort in your stomach and how to mitigate that. So this uh, lemon tech, definitely look it up. Um, a lot of people that are apprehensive because they've heard of people shitting themselves or puking or whatever with psychedelics, this can help maybe bridge that gap. Um, maybe more softly, uh, coach them into the process without the threat of, uh, them having, you know, violent vomiting or whatever. I will have to try that next, next time. So, yeah, (laughs) Yeah, so I thought that was pretty neat. And, you know, there are some, uh, articles out there that talk about why people get sick and most of them point to this chitin molecule. Uh, mm-hmm. But there are other 
you know, people talk about things that might be bad in the mushroom, definitely not eating your mushrooms raw because yeah. then they'll, you know, have a much more higher content of chitin and, you know, potential bacteria and other things. Yeah. Like yeah. Yeah. But I noticed like when I boiled, like, cause it, was, it wasn't like boiled it, but I like seeped it in a, like a lower heat, but I kind of did similar. I added a little bit of lemon and honey with the kind of just give it some, not like the actual taste, try to cover it up a little bit, but. Cause it is fucking disgusting. I mean, nobody has yeah. ever said that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Psilocybin mushroom taste. Yeah. Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Even bugs, you cover them with chocolate and it's tastes good. You cannot do that with the psilocybin mushroom. That taste <laughs> is, is irrefutable. Yeah. Um, yeah. But we've been making chocolates. Jill and I, we made some chocolates with toffee bits Yeah, and they taste really, really good. So okay. I see, you'll have to try that recipe. My fiance has a suggestion. What was that? Let's hear it. Heat it up and put it in the capsules. Grind it up and put it in the, the gel capsules. With like a coffee grinder? Yeah. 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 I haven't done that. I know I have the capsules, the yeah. empty capsules, and I have the coffee grinder, but I have not connected A to B. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I, uh, I I promise it's on the list, but we've gotten to the chocolates and haven't made it to the... Uh, the <laughs> <laughs> How are the chocolates though? Amazing. Amazing. Oh, they were? We okay. One batch. We made one batch where I used the coffee grinder to grind it up into like a, like a, a pulpy, like almost like a, like a sandy texture. Okay. And that was terrible to work with because it was just hard to mold the chocolate. Yeah. Kind yeah. of fluffed up and create little pockets and stuff. But yeah. we started using like one of those little choppers that creates okay. like little, almost like you would spices. Okay. And that, that little form factor, those little pieces they work really well with like chocolate chips that are melted and some toffee okay. bits. And then we put it into little molds and let it freeze and make uh, candy bars. Okay. That sounds like a good, bars. that sounds like a good, like party appetizer there. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, you don't want to eat the whole thing just willy nilly, but yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, dude, I was able to perform an appendectomy at age 14. I think I can handle a couple mushrooms. It's not just a TV show. Jesus Christ. <laughs> Did you see that unicorn? Its horn was so shiny. Thank you for, for having me back here. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here and just to, to be able to share this experience because it was my first time doing uh, that high of a dose. So I took five grams. Fantastic. Um, and, uh, and it couldn't have went better. It, it was really a positive experience. So I had like, I mean, if, uh, if some people out there are like having apprehensions about doing that sort of thing, um, I had those apprehensions, like I've had mushroom experiences in the past that were not pleasant. Um, and, uh, I feel like the key thing was like, everybody's told me mindset and, and that was the key thing to go in with a positive mindset. And yeah, that's was, the, the set when people talk about set and setting mindset. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that, that's crucial. Um, and, uh, like I was, I was talking to different people, telling them, you know, I'm going to do this and kind of getting my mind ready for it. And, and I was like expecting it to go bad. Really? I was expecting a bad trip because a buddy of mine told me that that happened to him. But like after the bad trip, he just felt amazing. And like he had let go of a bunch of bullshit. Wow. Um, so I was like, I was okay with that because I thought it was going to be therapeutic and, um, but it was more of a, of just a really positive experience. And I was like, okay, this might be bad, but I'm going to do it anyways. I'm going to learn what I can from it. Um, and I don't know, I just, I, I went in there with some trust, some confidence that, um, that I was going to be able to control it. You know? I love that. And now that sucks, man, that somebody planted a seed that it was going to be a bad experience or that it could potentially be a bad experience. How, um, so you going into it, did you still have that in the back of your mind or were you able to kind of shed that before you actually went under the knife? Um, I had, I, it was on my mind. It was oh. like, because it had been bad before, like okay. with smaller doses I had had just, you know, um, during the pandemic, like, and you just lose your job and you know, not the best time to trip. Sure. Um, so I was apprehensive for that reason. And I just, after talking to a bunch of people about it and, um, I, I kind of was able to, um, just make, 
more sense out of those fears and not just let them be these looming, um, overriding forces that kind of derailed my experience. Um, it was more just, I think, like healthy apprehension. So would you say like, because of the, the confidence you had in the medicine, I mean, based on the conversations, based on kind of like your research, the confidence level you had in taking that sizable amount or that much psilocybin, that was enough to kind of carry you through and combat some of those bad things that could have just overwhelmed you otherwise. Yeah. Yeah, wow. totally. Um, and, Very cool. uh, I love that. and then the set, the setting, like, so mindset obviously is crucial. And then just the physical setting that you're in that helped me a lot. So I was just, uh, I was at my place. I was with my buddy, uh, my other buddy from jujitsu. Um, and, uh, and, it just, I set up the lights, I set up music, uh, an air diffuser, so there was a scent in the air. Awesome. Um, and, and just everything, like all my senses were like occupied. Perfect. You know? And so I felt like that helped guide the trip. Um, so, and that then I, I put also, this was crucial that I put no expectations as far as like, this is, has to be a good time or like even socializing. Like I made it clear to my buddy that. I, uh, I'm just going to sit here. Like, I don't, I'm going to probably not talk very much, you know, I'm going to be in my own world. So I like made that commitment to just lay there. And that's, and, that's absolutely perfect. Like when I've had my best experiences, it, you get into it with just a level of calm and peace that music and all the senses, like you said, it's almost like a flow state that you have to get into for the things to open up like a flower. Yes. Because if you don't do that, if the setting you know, the setting and the set are almost, there's like a symbiotic relationship be between the two. And I say that a lot. Um, without one, you really can't, the other one doesn't do its due diligence. So by creating that setting with all the senses in motion and creating that flow state, that's when your mind really gets at ease, settles down, and things just start to pop up. So I think uh, that level of preparation is absolutely essential. I want to ask you about your diet though. Like, um, what did you do? Like, when did you take the dose and what did you do diet wise or preparation wise leading up to that experience? Yeah. Yeah. That was also a, a primary consideration. Um, so I fasted. Well, I, um, I ended up having to do a massage. So I had to work and I, I wasn't like able to do it as earlier. So I ate an apple with peanut butter. Okay. Uh, just that morning, and then like I tripped a few hours later, so I don't feel like that was uh, that affected it. You well, know? That's, a, that's a healthy. I mean, you don't want to eat a big steak and potato. You're like you want something that's fairly healthy, organic. You know, something that's not going to torment your system. Yeah. So uh, fruits, vegetables. Yeah, those are definitely good. I I personally like fast completely the way I do it now. Like when I really want to get into it, but I have to say, even when I don't do that the experience is about the same. So do you fast the day of or the day before I'll fast the day of. Okay. Yeah. I do intermittent fasting on a pretty regular basis. Yeah. So I'll have like a 15 hour window where, um, I, I don't eat. Yeah. And so with that, it makes it kind of easy for me to just segue that right into the next day and just keep fasting. Nice. Yeah. And I know Felix and Patrick are big proponents of the fasting method as well. Um, did you, put them in any sort of tea or do you just eat them raw or like what'd you do eating wise? So, uh, my buddy, I guess I'll, I'll just Felix. Yeah. Uh, well, we all love Felix. I'll Felix is a friend of the program. He's uh, <laughs> going to be a regular. So get yeah. used to, get used to his name. No last names. Just, uh, yeah. Yeah. We'll so, go first. uh, uh, he's, uh, so he actually made up the little brew or whatever. Honey um, and lemon. But honey and lemon oh, it had yeah. to be like, I had honey and he's like, no, nah, we need raw honey. So we use the raw honey. Ooh, did he actually um, get the bees? Did he did he go like to a beekeeper and go to that extent? Or? <laughs> I don't. I could see Felix I, going that extra mile. <laughs> possibly he didn't say it if he did, but um, he's like, bro, you got to have this this yeah, honey, only no, this honey. He met the bees. Um, <laughs> Bowed to the queen. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it. Uh, so it was it was important that it was local honey, raw honey. Very cool. Um, and uh, and then just lemons and pour the pour that in a mushroom so it's like this mud um and then put that in the fridge for 15 minutes and kind of let it do its thing and he explained the process to me a little bit um i don't know if i remember it quite right but i think uh it's it's basically and you were saying this earlier the well, lemon the fun the thing about it is the the episode the this episode i'm basically taking your integration and 
concatenating it with my dialogue from my buddy Dan, and in that we discussed the lemon tech and how to extract the psilocybin uh, yeah. from the psilocybin. So I'll get you that link, yes. and you'll have to listen to that conversation because it goes over exactly that. It's and it's a little more in depth. It than... doesn't doesn't address the honey. I think the honey might be just for some taste or consistency, right? But the lemon, the acid matches the pH level, the acidity level of the lemon or lime. Those are the two they recommend. Kind of matches your stomach acidity level. So it breaks things down, extracts the psilocin a little bit more quickly and just kind of gets things in motion. See, that's what I'd like a lot because the trip was so positive in the experience. However, that last part of it where like, okay, I'm waking up and... Uh, the coming, world's coming out of it. Uh, yeah. So that was, I, I feel pretty disoriented and uh, like, I, I don't, and it's such a slow process of coming back. You know, it's like, I, I just wanted my mind back at that point. This is, this is four hours of, uh, of, you know, going into it and laying there and I went in and out of different states. Um, and by the end of it, I was like, okay, I just want to be able to think. That's exhausting. Um, I mean, three, four hours of heroic tripping, you know, heroic, uh, mystical experience. That's a lot. And your body, your mind, it's over overall exhausting. And when I did ayahuasca, and I know this is very similar with a lot of other guided entheogen experiences, they recommend you take a, a few days afterwards to integrate both, uh, emotionally, physically, possibly vocally, if it's, you know, something you want to do journaling, whatever it is, but allow yourself to kind of um, wind down from the experience gracefully because there's still residual things and effects still Mm. going on in your brain. Even though you think it's done, like if you ever smoke cannabis, like indica after you, when you're coming down from your mystical experience, sometimes it bumps you back up again. Sometimes it acts like a booster. Just you're still going. And yeah. so even though you're not peaking there, you're never in the valley right away. You're, you're st- kind of still winding your way down. Okay. And just always keep that in mind. So never like plan a huge board meeting or, you know, first date or something for the next day, just cause you might not be in your right headspace. Yeah. It's all been, it's all positive and beneficial, but you yeah. just have to know, you know, what to expect from yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that, so that's that's good to hear, and I'll I'll try smoking next time. This last time I just drank bourbon, um, <laughs> fucking hey. to like get me back, and I, I would like to not have to do that. Yeah, you know? easy there, Johnny Walker. Uh, no, it's yeah. uh, the um the if that's I don't know I don't really drink I, I'm not a big drinker. You know, I have scotch every so often, some Miller High Lifes here and there, but I I never really drink with uh, psilocybin because it's kind of hard for me to gauge the effects. Yeah. The effects kind of get muddied in there. So yeah. for me, I can more isolate the cannabis effect and see where it's going as opposed to, you know, drinking some single malt and just kind of being <laughs> like, how is this? No clue where this it is was. Go. It was just, it was uncomfortable. It was like disorienting. It was just like, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm done, okay. you know? And so it was, there was kind of a, a sharp edge to, to that feeling, I guess. And so the, yeah, and that's, you know, I, but I'll, I'll definitely try the Indica next time. Yeah, yeah, um, and um, the Indica does a good job. You could even try CBD if you're not a cannabis smoker, but something to just kind of take the physical mental edge off. Yeah. Uh, if you're not a regular cannabis smoker, you don't want to freak yourself out, so uh, light, tread lightly. <laughs> right, right. No, exactly. You, you don't want to um, increase that feeling. But, exactly. Um, I know Andrew concurs. He likes to kind of boost it at a certain point with a little bit of cannabis okay. on the, uh, the other side of the mountain. Yeah. No, we were, we were definitely when we were, you know, tripping hard smoking okay. and like in a, uh, in enhancing it with that. Sure. Um, but, uh, I don't know if I would have need, like, I, it's hard to tell if that made any difference, you know? And that's good. That's a good point. Like you never want to, you don't want to dilute the effects of the medicine. I mean, because yeah. cannabis is medicine as well, a different kind of medicine. So you don't want to necessarily, you don't want to create a cocktail of medicine where you can't actually get the benefits of either because you can't distinguish what's doing what. So yeah. if you want to get a therapeutic psilocybin experience, allow the psilocybin to do the heavy lifting. And yeah. then you can kind of like um, massage the edges a little bit and keep it in bounds with some cannabis. But don't yeah. ever allow anything to take away, take the, uh, the luster away from yeah. the psilocybin. 
Yeah. It's got to have the spotlight. Well, I really want to try this uh, this method that you say about the lemon tech. Yes. Um, so that I can reduce that come and have it just be uh, a quicker experience. Because it felt like, honestly, man, um, I have done DMT once before, and it felt like that. Like, it, it felt... The come down like, felt like that? No, just the whole experience. Wow. Yeah. Awesome. It yeah. was, I mean, and, and probably like... Uh, maybe an hour and a half or between that and three hours. It, it's, you know, it's, it's kind of hard to tell. Um, felt as intense as the DMT. Um, it's a lot, I mean, it's a lot of psilocybin and the, depending on the strain and I know you, you work with good strains. It's, it's intense, man. So yeah. don't discount, you know, DMT is at the, the top of the, you know, on the Mount Rushmore of psychedelics because of its potency and effects and all that stuff psilocybin's right up there and with the, the right quantities man it'll hit you like a ton of bricks yeah a, a very uh awesome powerful benevolent ton of bricks but it'll hit you like a ton of bricks it yeah it, it was a beautiful uh ton of bricks man and <laughs> i i went into you know how the the senses you start to lose your ability to discern between senses sure and they sort of merge um i felt i i felt all that like that's that's kind of what I like, and that's what I feel like leads to creativity and growth. Um, but the the interesting part that I I want to hang on one second, Brody. We we don't need your commentary on this podcast. Uh, <laughs> He's giving it to that tennis ball. Yeah. Um, all right. So if you hear heavy breathing, I promise that's not Sean giving me a hand job under the podcast table. That's my dog. Yeah. No, we're gonna we're gonna turn it off for that. All right. So um, thanks, Brody. Okay, back to what you were saying. I apologize. No, no, you're good. Um, so, oh, what was I saying? So you were you were saying the senses were kind of in you working in unison. Yeah. So the the senses that that was a part, of, and I'm I'm getting familiar with that part as I do more psychedelic experiences. Um, but the part that's like starting to open up to me, and I had this during the DMT experience, was that there's a, a different world. Um, and maybe it's a dream world. Maybe it's not real. Maybe it's a real world and it's just in a different dimension that we can't see with our ordinary senses. And we have to have this, uh, portal, uh, to look at this world through. And, and I heard something on, uh, Michael Malice was saying it on Joe Rogan about how, uh, there's something about beings, like people, I, I hear different people say that they see beings during their DMT trips. Sure. And so, at, and then he like connected that, like maybe it's the fourth dimension. And so I, I think he's just kind of like reading forums and speculating here, but um, just to, to think that that, what if, you know, and it's, I've just been like noodling on that for, I did this a couple of weeks ago, but for, since then I've been thinking like, what, what about this other world, man? And it's right in front of us. Uh, right here, right now, that we're sort of interacting with, and we just don't have the um, the senses to uh, to see it or or feel it or whatever way. Well, it's like Sam Harris. If you ever listen to him, his definition of consciousness. I mean, there's really, you know, there's really no way to. It's not tangible. You know, it's a lot of this stuff is it's figurative. It's it, people really can uh, can't make it objective because everybody has their own way of spinning it. Um, you know, everybody's uh, sketch artist drawing of their experience looks a little bit different. There are commonalities throughout, but yeah. because there's nothing really tangible, you can't put your finger on it. It's hard to, a lot of the skeptics are just going to be called bullshit. You know, the science behind it. Yes, there's science. It's psychological science, but not the same kind of science you'd have to, to have to prove a new species or something like that. Right. But the consciousness discussion goes into that and you know, it's, it's a very subjective conversation. So with that idea that maybe we're not sensing everything, um, we only evolve to sense just to stay alive, right? Okay. So we, our senses do the bare minimum as far as what's right here, you know, what makes this world up. Out of, um, out of necessity, essentially. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we smell so we can tell if things are good or bad. We can see predators, prey, and, uh, you know here and then like just you think of the like with your wife being pregnant um the the senses fine-tune like because the mother needs to protect the baby and the mother needs to be more alert so it's i mean it's you know it's totally just for survival 
right? Nothing more than that. And so what happens where, I mean, we've gotten to a point where we're starting to do more than survive, right? Over the past, whatever, couple hundred years, uh, where we're thriving, right? Or, you know, killing ourselves. Um, but we have options and, and we can sure. do, we can explore these different sides of consciousness. Um, really and so that point. just made me think how we know nothing. We know nothing, you know, like as, as far as what's out there, like there's infinity that we don't know, you know, and uh, there's, you hear about like how Brody senses smells. No, um, and you're right. But if like, if you, if you're blind, if you lose your sight, your hearing is so much more powerful because you use it completely differently. Like you said, your necessities, your obligations, your environment changes and you adapt. The natural selection comes into play and you figure out how to survive. So yeah, yeah you take away any of those preconceived notions as to how you should be going about life, how you should be breathing, how you should be seeing, how you should be smelling or listening, any of those stuff, uh, any of those things. Now you get to see it fresh and you get to see it maybe the way my daughter will when she's first born. Yeah. That's the power of this stuff. And like yeah. you said, you can shift away, shift around the, uh, the strength of different senses, senses or bring them together in one snowball. And y you can't really do that a whole lot of other ways, man. Like Michael Jordan gets into his flow state because he's got, you know, consistent, awesome game uh, and the right mindset. This stuff kind of puts you there. Yeah. Yeah. In a way it does. It's, and I, I, Recall the phrase uh, "being reborn" uh, with the DMT trip. Sure, and and that makes sense. It's like you shed all your preconceived notions about self and about the world and about what this water bottle means. Yeah, for know? the for the listeners, he's clutching a uh, single use plastic water bottle. We don't condone them on the podcast. I gave it to him, so it's my fault. Uh, next time, we'll use a reusable water bottle. Very true. So, so getting yeah. back to your experience, so. Um, you were on the, the come down and you were like, Hey, I want this to end. Mm -hmm. Um, did you panic a little bit? Like I want this to end or this is exhausting or did you find yourself just easily going with the flow? Uh, no, I mean, I, I chose to, to drink to kind of deal with it. Gotcha. So I would call that like not going with the flow. <laughs> um, and it, but it was, it, it was okay. You know, it, it wasn't like uncomfortable. Like I have to get out of here, but I did like seek relief sure in the form of like i was really hungry at that point and i just ate obsessively um and and drank some and uh yeah and then i just kind of went to bed early so what would you uh, say like and you had a chaperone not a chaperone but a uh, a a buddy you do the the buddy system mm -hmm. when you take those sizable doses mm -hmm. never do it by yourself correct and you trusted your buddy your buddy has experience yeah uh, we're speaking of felix of course yeah. Um, I would definitely trust Felix with anybody's first psychedelic experience. Yeah. Um, so I guess what would you say your biggest takeaway is from your experience? And clearly it's an ongoing process. It's not like, Hey, I take this one amazing pill and I'm fixed forever. It's, you know, you're working towards just constant betterment, but what would you say for this particular session? Like what was your biggest takeaway? So I've always tried to do the trip and have, some lesson afterwards, some tangible idea that I can, uh, or a step that I can take. And I came out of this immediately with, uh, with none of that, you know? Um, and so my takeaway is that the lesson isn't necessarily something that you can verbalize. It might be something that your subconscious took in, in some way. And that you know intuitively, even though you can't explain it. Um, and that's where I think this, this we know 1% of things comes in. We know, you know, there's infinity that we don't know. Um, and, uh, but, because like, what are we sensing? What do we already have in us that we know intuitively, but we can't explain? Anyways, um, so after this, like in the days following the trip, I noticed that... Uh, at things that I would normally get irritable at, um, I felt like I had the choice on whether to, to let that bother me. I love that. And this was pretty consistent. This was like, I noticed, I'm like, huh, that usually, and it's like stupid shit. Like, um, you know, a, a big line at Trader Joe's or just whatever it is. I was like, I felt like I had the option to let that shit go or to, um, 
or to you know get I love it because it sheds yeah. some of that program because we all get programmed every time every time we have a bad experience if we're in that same setting again it just kind of kicks in memory sets in and we are programmed to freak out a little bit exactly. or just expect the worst so shedding that little bit of uh, memory weight shedding a little bit of the way that you attach yourself to that memory yeah it's so powerful man yeah i love that well and then you say a little bit which a little bit is true but the collection of those like when those irritations stack up you know that can be a lot so if you're if you're just in the habit of of letting shit go like continuously or if you're in the habit of letting of not letting it go right whatever it is it adds up to something more powerful sure um so yeah a small change goes a long way over time i love it and yeah just disrupting the program a little bit because the program says every time i go to this line of trader joe's i get annoyed and it's cold and by the time i get inside i forgot what i wanted to bring and whatever the case may be it's just a whole snowball of shit to make you worried and pissed off but if you throw a little wrench in there and maybe like some of it isn't attached to a bad thing or gets disassociated with the overall theme, uh, it's amazing what positive impact that has. Oh, Your brain doesn't totally, know how to be shitty anymore. Totally, man. Well, and then you realize like stuff that was by default that you didn't think about, it's just like you just get mad or Yeah, that's react. why they say that smokers um, that do extensive psilocybin therapy get tremendous relief. Maybe not for an, a sustained period of time, but they get tremendous relief for a short period of time because all those routines and instincts and they get disrupted a little bit yeah and no, it's I, I think it helps you see your folly um you you get to where you're uh you're like is this really what i've been doing right is this really how i've been going about things and yeah it's it's like that uh uh being a baby you know, you're seeing it for the first time and you have the option whether or not to continue that. Yeah, but you have all the knowledge of not being a baby, all the knowledge and understanding of humanity as yeah. an adult, but you're able to kind of think like a baby. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, it's it's beautiful, man. And so for the next one, I want to go back to this world, whatever it is that I'm, I'm having trouble explaining, but I want to get more familiar with this world. I can tell that it affected you positively, man. Yes. And I'm, I'm glad to hear that. That's... That, that's my whole goal. Anytime I bring somebody into the mix or try to, you know, coach them through a big experience, as long as you have a smile on your face afterwards and you have positive reflection, man, I'm happy as a clam. Yeah. So this was, this was awesome, dude. Thanks for yeah. sharing. Yeah. No, thank you for, uh, for having me on here, man. This is, this is amazing. And it's, it's, uh, I think the therapy continues like as you yeah. talk about it. Dude, thanks so much. I expect to hear Sean back on the podcast again soon. Um, have a great day. Love yeah. you, man. Thanks brother. Love you. Walk with me, walk with me, baby. Come on and-